Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Kefin Technologies Limited Q3 FI24 on a conference call hosted by IIFL Securities Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listening only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is been recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Devesh Agarwal from IIFL Securities Limited. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Q3 FY24 earnings call of KFIN Technologies Limited. From the company, we have Mr. Srikant Nadela, uh, MD and CEO, Mr. Vivek Mathur, CFO, and Mr. Amit Murarka, Head Investor Relations. I would now hand over the call to Mr. Srikant for his opening remarks, which will be followed up by a Q&A session. Thank you, and over to you, Srikant. Thank you so much, Devesh. Very good morning to one and all. Uh, it's a great day, bright start to our uh, um, new quarter. Uh, I thank uh, my management team who are part of the call, as well as everyone who's contributed to uh, the continual growth of our organization. Over the next 40, uh, 25 minutes, I would cover the broad, the broad business highlights. I would, uh, at which point in time, uh, hand it over to uh, Mr. Martha uh, to cover the financial aspects of it, and we'll then leave the floor open for questions. Uh, I believe the investor presentation uh, could have been circulated broadly. Uh, the results that were declared uh, the previous week uh, on Friday, uh, we continue uh, to deliver to our, our promise and commitment of uh, meaningful growth, profitable growth, uh, and a growth that is uh, sustainable and uh, one that is getting uh, de-risked uh, with each passing day. Uh, risk here being uh, the cyclicalities that a market brings, uh, the cyclicalities that a particular asset class may bring, the cyclicalities that any particular geography or a country uh, could bring. Uh, as I had explained back in the day, our strategy uh, had been to be able to diversify into every financial asset class. Uh, you would uh, recollect that we are the only uh, entity in the country uh, who manage uh, the capital markets from the standpoint of issuer services on the equity and the bond markets, mutual funds, uh, alternate investment funds, national pension system, private retirement schemes. And we do this in India uh, and in Malaysia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, and now Thailand to start. Just a quick overview in terms of the financials uh, that we have delivered thus far, uh, the Q3 ending uh, December 2023. Uh, our revenue clocked uh, growth of 16% year on year uh, and an EBITDA growth at 21, uh, and the margin percentage uh, nearing 45% and the PAT growth of 25%. Uh, this is, um, despite uh, certain uh, one of episodical expenditure that we uh, continue to incur uh, in the context of our uh, uh, aspiration to uh, deliver uh, similar solutions and value proposition to many other countries beyond India. Uh, if you uh, were to adjust it for the one time such expansion, we believe our growth would have been uh, higher than what is currently clocked in. Uh, we are extremely uh, uh, satisfied with the growth of the controllable components of the income, especially the value-added solutions, uh, which has grown near about 60% year on year, and today occupies near about 6% plus of the total revenue profile and one that is growing really fast. Uh, this is where a significant amount of the company's effort uh, had been to be able to create differentiated solutions for our clients, especially in the form of uh, data, uh, cloud, uh, the API infrastructure, the analytics associated with that, and the entire CRM stack, so to speak. Uh, our share of non-domestic mutual fund business, as uh, I've called out in terms of the de-risking uh, strategy that we've adopted, uh, stands at 31% uh, for the period ending uh, 31st December, and one that is uh, continuing to grow faster than the more mature businesses of mutual funds and issue solutions. Mutual fund business itself uh, had grown on the back of uh, uh, significant uh, net flows uh, into the industry, uh, a massive uh, spike in SIP, which is a very, very important parameter uh, to judge the health of the financial asset class because that is a sticky retail uh, investment book uh, that has nearly doubled over the last uh, one and a half years or so. Uh, KFN Tech, on the other hand, continues to grow. While industry itself has been growing, uh, we have been outpacing the industry uh, in the context of having uh, several more clients uh, in the industry. 
uh, and also the faster growth profile of our clients. For example, uh, six out of the uh, 10 fastest growing asset management companies uh, you know, are with k uh, We have been uh, playing our uh, little role to help our clients uh, grow faster than the industry. Uh, we are yet to clock revenue from some of the newer asset management companies which have gone live in the recent past. That includes Bajaj Mutual Fund and Old Bridge, which has just gone live in the preceding quarter. Our overall AUM grew at 22.7 vis-a-vis 22.2% for the overall industry. We have gained uh, about 30 basis points of market share uh, in the preceding quarter on the overall AUM uh, standpoint. From issuer solution standpoint, which is the other uh, larger and uh, the traditional and the vintage business that we have, uh, we continue to expand uh, our uh, profile of the corporate clients. 170 new clients have been added in the preceding quarter, taking the number closer to 6,000. Uh, our market share of the uh, NSC 500 companies by uh, market cap uh, stands about 46.5%. Added near about 5 million folios, as we all know, our revenue profile for issuer solutions is a factor of a unique price on the number of folios, hence uh, expansion of IPO market, expansion of retail investor participation into the company, all of that goes on to help our business to grow uh, you know, in a fairly secular manner. Uh, we have managed near about 46% of all the main board IPOs from the standpoint of the market share, which is a very critical uh, parameter to be uh, considered in terms of the revenue growth of any organization. We have managed five out of the top 10. We have also orchestrated uh, several transitions from the industry uh, into the uh, organization even as we are hoping to hear some positive news from several others in the coming quarter. Outside of these two, uh, it's an international uh, uh, expansion story that uh, had been differentiating uh, k Fintech. Uh, the last we spoke, the total number of clients we had were 50. It has now been increased to 54. Uh, in the last uh, uh, meeting, you know, I have uh, spoken about two letter of intent received from two clients from Malaysia, one of which has been converted into a signed contract and transition has begun. One of the other has uh, trans uh, uh, in the form of a letter of uh, award uh, for the contract, which should uh, be signed in the coming weeks. Uh, four of the transactions which started uh, in uh, Q1 and Q2 uh, are due to go live uh, into February and March, which effectively means the revenue per uh, four additional contracts will start to kick in into the Q1 of fiscal 24 onwards. Uh, we are hopeful to see a turnaround of the markets in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, which, as we all know, have been uh, reasonably tepid uh, with uh, the mark-to-market gains hopefully to be received into the Q1 onwards. Our growth in the international markets, uh, you know, hopefully will grow much faster than what it had been thus far. Uh, this particular entire segment of international and other uh, financial uh, asset classes that includes uh, alternatives and pensions has grown near about 30% year-on-year year, uh, as against 17% um, for mutual funds and about 20% plus by show solutions for the same period year-on-year. Year. Uh, we continue to win uh, uh, several alternate investment funds. You know, we have added two new Gip City clients in Q3, uh, taking our total tally to about 16, uh, and uh, we continue to uh, have land and expand in the existing uh, clientele, uh, which helps us to win our new uh, uh, scope of work uh, for an existing client uh, in Malaysia and one in the Middle East as well. Our intent to grow uh, the fastest growing asset class uh, currently in India, which is Alternate Investment Fund, uh, you know, have been paying us rich dividends. We today have 455 uh, funds, uh, of which there are uh, at least 100 plus funds which are yet to draw on the capital, which is a critical trigger for our uh, revenue. Uh, which effectively means that our revenue growth of nearly doubling from the previous year to now. Uh, you know, will only expand as many of the other funds who have already signed up with us start drawing the capital and investing uh, from there on. Uh, we have won several new clients. Some of the names include uh, additional funds coming from Nippon, uh, MOP uh, from the GIFT and ASK, so on and so forth. And I had been, and, I, and I'm very excited to share with this uh, news of uh, an absolutely brand new platform we have created called Exalt, uh, which is the only at-scale cloud solutioning uh, alternative specific platform that has been created, uh, which is a fully integrated transfer agency fund administration solution overlaid by digital CRM and analytics. Uh, we believe that this is a game changer initiative and a platform that will help us uh, to add significant value to our clientele, uh, their investors, and the entire distribution uh, fraternity along the way. And this platform is also multi asset, multi geography. Uh, multilingual as well, uh, and multi-currency, which effectively translates 
uh, it to be a platform that is uh, ready for the world and not just India, but made in India nevertheless. Uh, the last of the asset class we are looking to is the national pension system. We have been outpacing the industry by a factor of two for the past three years. We have grown 25.3% year on year, whereas industry grew about 12% broadly. Uh, we have expanded our total market share uh, close to uh, 8%. We all must recognize that we started this uh, line of business just about four and a half years back. And from nothing at all today, we are nearly 10% of the total pension subscriber base, and most of it coming from the private sector where it is not mandatory, so to speak. Uh, we continue to double down our uh, interest and investment into the national pension scheme as we believe it is one of uh, the very important asset classes every Indian should invest in uh, to uh, take care of um, their retirement uh, plan. Quickly moving on, uh, on the overall India performance, uh, uh, it is not lost on anybody, so I would not uh, dwell too much into it except to tell you all that uh, every asset class, whether it's equity, like real markets, bond markets, mutual funds, alternatives, uh, and every parameter points to an uh, elevated interest levels, uh, participation by the broader uh, populace of the country, uh, expansion of FII, FPI uh, uh, investment into the country, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know certain demographic dividends that are uh, helping us and will continue to help for a foreseeable future. For example, uh, every single year, near about 75 lakh new invest or new. Uh, Indian citizens turn uh, major, uh, earlier being minor, which uh, effectively translates to many of them wanting to invest in uh, financial asset classes uh, as a strong participant in the uh, capital market ecosystem and uh, you know somebody who's uh, doing pioneering job in driving ease of doing business for new investors onboarding them and providing the ease to transact. Uh, we believe that uh, you know several new million uh, millions of investors. Uh, will come into the industry as has been the case over the past two to three years. And a lot of that would flow in the form of SIPs, which is a very uh, tricky retail book, and that I think is the harbinger of far greater growth for the entire industry and not just mutual funds, but including for uh, equities and the alternate investment funds as well. Uh, the registration of the new alternate investment funds with SEBI had also been uh, seeing significant expansion. There's been 20% jump in the new funds that have registered here on year. Uh, and that's sizable if you speak in the context of number of uh, funds itself. Uh, and the amount of capital that they could draw down uh, is obviously a factor of uh, the, uh, the the value proposition each other fund manager has to offer. Uh, we are privileged and honored to have uh, some of the largest and the marquee asset managers of the country uh, being both our clientele as well as investors uh, in some problems here. Uh, Cape Index growth, very specific to mutual funds, uh, had uh, you know uh, you know grown about 22.7 as I've already called out compared to 22.2% in the industry level. Uh, we continue to have uh, even a sequential growth of 5.5 these are these industry at 4.7% on the overall AUM. Uh, there has been a, a slight uh, a reduction in the equity component uh, of our market share uh, that is largely uh, on the back of several of our clients. Um, Driving a paradigm shift in the form of uh, passives to be a significant growth factor, uh, both for uh, the client themselves and for the end investor, so to speak. So it is a very welcoming, uh, you know, a paradigm shift. Not a paradigm shift, but a shift that augurs very well for the industry, as low-cost expense ratio products, uh, you know, help uh, the investors and the broader participation of them into the market from here on. Uh, we have managed near about 45% uh, of all the NFOs and near about 50% of the fund mobilization that happened in the industry uh, came to Cape Index of its clients, which is uh, uh, you know, obviously very good in the context that we managed 32% of the total market share. Uh, fund mobilization, however, is at 50% of all new funds that have happened in the industry into this quarter. Uh, I hope uh, and I wish my client will a uh, far greater number of NFOs and a successful one fit it into the coming quarters. The transaction volume uh, continued to uh, expand at a faster pace as compared to the AUM, which is understandable. Uh, that just explains the nature of the business, uh, and that is one of the critical reasons why we've been uh, continually investing in technology, infrastructure, cloud computing capabilities, uh, to be able to future-proof uh, you know, our business uh, to make sure that our clients uh, are best served uh, in the industry, uh, not just in India, across the world. Uh, today, we are happy to also tell you that you know four out of the top 10 asset management companies are with Cape Intech, uh, just about uh, six quarters back, uh, we had just, uh, you know, uh, one, I think two. Uh, today we have four of them. Uh, with this continued, uh, you know, faster growth uh, and the velocity of our clients, we hope to have a parity into the next, uh, you know, two to three quarters, so to speak. 
Uh, MF Central, uh, a joint initiative created uh, with CANS and us, uh, has gained significant traction into the previous quarter. We had about seven million, six and a half million hits in Q3, and one that's been growing faster. Uh, and uh, the value proposition together, what we're able to offer to the industry is expanding uh, with each pause, uh, with each passing day, uh, whether it is uh, loan uh, solution, business solutions such as loan against mutual funds to uh, CAS APIs to uh, being able to provide investors the best in class services is what this initiative is all about to drive ease of doing business. And we believe we have a lot more to offer in times to come together. Uh, on the issue of solutions, just quickly going back, uh, the uh, market capitalization, as I've already called out, uh, as of uh, uh, December 2023, is about 46.5 percent in the Nifty 500 class. We continue to add both uh, listed and unlisted companies and orchestrate transitions. We have recently uh, trans transferred Usha Martin uh, Limited Group uh, from one of the competitions uh, into KFintech, and uh, we are in conversation with some more, and hopefully they rectify into the coming quarter. On the international business, uh, as I've called out, we've added four new clientele, and uh, uh, with the market turning around in many parts of the Asia, I, I hope uh, that you know we'll have a faster growth and traction. Uh, as we speak, uh, there are uh, uh, close to uh, 20 million dollars worth of pipeline uh, that is uh, that is you know warm uh, and uh, has passed uh, the technical and the functional round. Uh, meaning they are into uh, the commercial round, and uh, should any of them fructify, there would be a step up growth into the international business, uh, you know, which we hope to see in time to come. Uh, our acquisition of the fund administration company called Hexagram has been helping us uh, direct growth into the organization, uh, as well as uh, its uh, significant impact of, uh, you know, helping Kfintech to be uh, the only provider who can have a uh, who has a fully integrated made in India uh, TAS and additional platform together, uh, offering. Uh, you know, uh, uh, absolutely unparalleled solutions and services, uh, you know, with a, a single, uh, you know, point of contact uh, and someone who can deliver all the services that are required for a fund manager. Uh, alternatives uh, have already covered uh, that space. On the value-added solutions, I just want to take a minute and uh, call out our growth of 60% year on year uh, is um, uh, something that uh, I hope, uh, you know, to maintain as a, a trajectory into uh, the coming quarters and years. Uh, happy to uh, announce that in just the last uh, one week to 10 days uh, itself, we have signed uh, three uh, medium to large size contracts purely in the space of tech. Uh, that is uh, data lake creations, uh, you know, for our, uh, uh, you know, and uh, there's a client as well. Uh, and we are expanding, uh, taking these offerings beyond the traditional asset management space uh, into uh, the broader BFSI sector, uh, including uh, on the uh, capital companies as well. Uh, so that is uh, that is a news that augurs well, given the context of the number of companies which are into the lending uh, are quite uh, substantially larger than the number of companies who are in the asset management space. Uh, we uh, are also uh, nearly done with our uh, wealth management platform, which we uh, hope and aspire, uh, you know, we you know will be the platinum standard, uh, you know, for the wealth management industry in time to come. With this, uh, I would uh, hand it over uh, to Vivek to cover the financial performance. Thank you, Srikant. Uh, so the financial performance has been strong in this quarter, and uh, YTD ended December 23. Uh, we have seen an increase in revenue uh, by 16.3%, uh, while in the domestic mutual fund business, the average AUM went up by more than 19%. Uh, the revenue went up by about 14%, so we had the telescopic pricing impact. Although the, the overall yield still remains range-bound, it is about 3.8 bips. Uh, you know, so we, we operate in 3.5 to 3.9 bips uh, sort of a segment. And uh, this is something which continues to remain strong. Uh, and as Shrikant mentioned, uh, where so the new continues to grow. Uh, overall, even on sequentially on quarter and quarter, quarter also there is a growth of 4.7 percent. And our you know business mix continues to remain uh, you know similar as we have been mentioning about 66 percent from domestic mutual fund. Uh, and then about 3.4% within mutual fund because of VAT services, so overall about 69%. Issue of solutions continues to be about 15 to 16%. International and other investor solutions is about 10%, which was uh, about 8.8% .8 last year, same period of nine months. 
within that we have uh, you know we are seeing that the overall businesses in AIF and wealth uh, continues to grow it is about 5% as compared to about 3.8% within that 10% uh, and rest is about GFS and small businesses like NPS and mobile uh, and there is tremendous growth in terms of uh, segment business as AIF uh, you know has outgrown all other businesses it has grown up uh, you know, in terms of year on year growth by almost uh, 86% as compared to the rest of the businesses growing in mid teens or a little higher uh, as compared to uh, you know the, the AIF business uh, you know we, we continue to remain focused on growing our international and other industry solutions business as you can't mention uh, we are you know we have got uh, you know new mandates uh, in the current quarter, now, you know, besides the last quarter, even in the current quarter, which will actually get fructified in terms of contracts, and you will see um, exchange information being filed as and then we get the letter of mandate. So we remain buoyant about uh, you know the international business growth. Uh, overall, expenses have also gone up. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, overall expenses, uh, you know, there is a growth even on quarter on quarter. There is a growth uh, if you see. And, and we feel that you know the overall expense growth is more fueled by our you know people strategy of getting best of the talent and retaining them. Uh, overall expenses have gone up by 7.4 percent year on year and 3.3 percent quarter on quarter. And and that is something we feel you know the retention bonus paid to the employees and uh, you know attracting more employees uh, in growing businesses like AIF uh, and also because number of transactions have gone up substantially as Shrikant earlier mentioned. We have strengthened our audit and surveillance team and we hired uh, more people there uh, besides hiring more people in uh, you know AIF operations. So you know within the quarter we would have hired almost uh, you know more than 120 people uh, in these businesses and support functions to make them stronger uh, which has resulted in slightly higher employee cost uh, but that is not something which will continue uh, ever after. This is sufficient to take care of the growing volumes. As a result of that, the EBITDA has gone up uh, and touched 43% versus 39.9% last year, same nine months period. And it's almost in, uh, you know, touching distance of 45%, uh, you know, for the quarter. Tax has gone up uh, by 23.7 percent year on year and about 9 percent uh, sequentially quarter on quarter, and uh, you know we are now at 28.2 percent tax percentage, and uh, quarter ended with 30.6 percent uh, tax percentage. Diluted EPS uh, has gone up to 10 rupees, which was 8.2 last year. Now we are sitting on cash and cash equivalents of more than 313 crores. This is after repayment or buyback of the RPS of 134 crores, which was uh, paid out at the end of November 2023. So we have strong cash flow, strong balance sheet. Net worth has gone up uh, 2,062 crores, which was 870 crores last year. So it's an 18% growth on net worth, almost 200 crores up as compared to last year. DSO continues to be in the range of about 65, 66 days, and we are putting measures to improve it. Although the overview is just 26 days, but we are getting more rigorous because of the diversity of our business into, uh, you know, uh, not just domestic mutual fund, but corporate industry and AIF with new client wins. Uh, we are trying to uh, reduce it further, internally putting that discipline in. So uh, this was more about the financials. Happy to take any questions now. The floor is open. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wish to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handset while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while question queue assembles. First question is from the line of Abhijit from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, the first one uh, is on the international uh, slash alternate uh, business. Uh, so Shikant, if you could just again, you know, simplify for us and maybe break down the revenue pipeline uh, in this part of the business. I think one number that you mentioned, uh, $20 million, uh, seems like a pretty strong uh, growth runway from where we are today. 
So a little more color here uh, and numbers if possible. Thank you, Ajit. Uh, very good morning. Yes, so uh, the international business, uh, are we, so there are two important, I mean, three, uh, three factors rather. So winning the deals uh, and obviously uh, hitting the revenue has a certain elite time, as I explained back in the day. Uh, the last three, four quarters that uh, we have been uh, announcing about the new win, uh, four out of those wins, um, uh, you know, are turning into revenue generating, uh, you know, accounts uh, starting late this quarter into early into the coming quarter. Uh, and they are uh, medium-sized asset management companies, which will add uh, a decent amount of revenue growth into the coming year, point number one. Uh, second, uh, the deals that we have announced in the previous quarter, one of them has converted into contract, which means that the transition uh, you know, has just started. And the other one, which is uh, one of the uh, largest integrated asset manager in the form of both private and public mandates in Malaysia, uh, that contracting process is underway, which will be concluded hopefully in the next you know, two to three weeks. And then we will go on to initiate the transition for that, which will be a small, which will be a short burst activity, so to speak. So that's the second. The third, in terms of the pipeline, uh, we uh, have a sizable number of clients, as is evident, you know, 54 clients. But uh, uh, obviously, the revenue profile, you know, in comparison to Indian clients, isn't as substantial as is evident. Uh, that's largely a factor of the size of the asset management company, you know, whom we have as clients today. Uh, given we are relatively new uh, in almost all of these geographies, you know, probably the longest vintage we have is about four and a half years in Malaysia, and uh, some of the other countries suggest you know two years. Uh, it is, uh, but uh, understood that the large asset management companies, uh, you know, would want to see a uh, certain amount of track record, continued performance, as well as uh, the work we are doing with the regulator for each of those local geographies. Uh, and then, uh, you know, is when they would start having serious conversations with us. Uh, happy to say that the current pipeline and the clients we are talking to are mostly amongst the top 10 asset management clients in that in each of those geographies, so to speak. Right. Although a win in each of these uh, client mandates, uh, you know, would have a force multiplier effect. It will, you know, hopefully will drive a multiples of revenue growth as against percentages of growth. Right. So the 20 million dollars is largely in that context. So the last. Uh, uh, you know, uh, large contract we had one uh, happened to be the third largest bank-based asset management company in Thailand called Kungsi Asset Manager. The transition is underway and is expected to conclude uh, by end of, uh, you know, this fiscal. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, given uh, that, you know, we are managing one of the largest one out there, uh, uh, many of the top 10 are having, you know, uh, very serious and uh, engaging conversations with us to be able to render value-added solutions, uh, you know, both in terms of transfer agency and fund administration at a country level, right? Uh, so it is that, uh, you know, uh, pipeline that I was talking about. So it is not uh, an early stage pipeline, but a mid to advanced uh, conversations with the client. Uh, sometimes the uh, uh, contracting process is a little protracted uh, in that part of the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, given now we have a, a track record of nearly five years, uh, never lost a single client, and have been adding at least two to three clients every single quarter, uh, there had been a substantive interest in almost every single geography in that part of the world. Uh, in addition to starting operations in Thailand, uh, we are going to start, uh, uh, you know, operations in Singapore, even as we have some clients there already. Uh, you know, we are working with the uh, regulatory process to be able to secure alignment to uh, both to set up the office as well as start uh, in-country uh, operations in Singapore. Thanks, Shrigan, for that. Uh, just to follow up here uh, on the international side, uh, like how do we look at uh, the investments that are going into it um, uh, in terms of lead lag? Because I think the margin number that you report, uh, I'm not sure how reflective it is uh, uh, about uh, you know the underlying um, you know operating numbers uh, in this part of the business. But uh, it was a it was a it was a decline uh, sequentially there. So at what point of time uh, this business starts to deliver, you know, somewhere close to 15, 20% sort of margin numbers? No, great question. Uh, so the way to look at this, Abhijit, is uh, at a client level, uh, not at a geography level. We cannot compare the growth market uh, to that of India scenario where we have 60% market share, many of the clients being there for the last decade to two. 
uh, and a new client addition, uh, you know, uh, takes a certain amount of time, at least three to four to five years in India, for example, for them to make any meaningful corpus, for me to make any meaningful revenue out of it. Whereas, uh, you know, in, in that part of the world or any new country for that matter, uh, a client level margin is what we look at. And in almost all cases, you know, we are tracking to, uh, you know, anywhere in the range of 35 to 40 percent. Uh, but uh, at a uh, entity level, uh, international may look a little less because a continued uh, expansion into newer geographies, continued expansion of technological capabilities, the platforming capabilities, the transition cost that we incur as we migrate a client from, uh, you know, incumbent, including their own captive to a fintech. So those costs tend to vitiate, uh, you know, what is otherwise a profit profile, which I think is pretty uh, you know, good. And I'll give you a leading indicator to that, for example, is the basis point. Uh, in India, our blender yield, as you have seen, is roughly about 3.9, uh, you know, and had been fairly stable for us for the past X number of quarters. The same uh, for my international business is 5.2 basis points. Right? So, pound to pound, the yield is higher. Uh, the number of transactions one would expect will be substantially lower than when compared to India, right? Because uh, these are high ticket size, low volume countries, such as Singapore, so on and so forth. And go at every client level, the margin is healthy. But when you aggregate at an overall entity level, it looks like lower because of continued investments into, uh, you know, new geographic expansion. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. And the, and the second and the last question is that uh, in this context, I think the uh, the core business, the MFRT, as well as the issuer solutions business, they have been delivering very solid, uh, you know, margin improvements. So just wanted to understand uh, what is the level of uh, you know operating leverage that is available there in the sense uh, can these businesses grow um, you know at uh, you know mid to high single digit uh, expense growth uh, on a sustainable basis uh, see our ex just like in the case of international to uh, in uh, domestic side uh, abhijit we are Future proofing or you know endeavoring to future proof our business for volume expansion. You know, we've seen a volume expansion of north of 40, 30 percent, and that volume expansion actually adds much higher amount of data storage, cyber security related costs, uh, the engineering environment management, et cetera, that is required for our core operation. So uh, so it actually translates to a far higher quantum of engineering efforts and work and maybe even costs at our end as compared to the transaction volume that you see in the industry. Uh, the expense that you have been seeing, uh, you know, that has slightly gone up in the last two quarters, which I would expect, uh, you know, we'll, we will continue to invest. And as you know, we all expense, uh, you know, all of it out, uh, most of it at least. Uh, and ergo, uh, these are not necessarily investments that are on the balance sheet, but already not into the p &L, even at the at 45% or data numbers. Uh, this particular uh, investments are required uh, to future-proof our businesses, right? I mean, the investments we made uh, three to four years back, for example, have been continually driving the operating leverage, uh, right? Reducing the pure play operations cost, the risk associated with that, uh, and hence the margin profile continues to stay put. The investments that we are making now are the ones that are going to help us into the next five to seven years. Because uh, what we are now doing is not incremental changes, but a complete re-architecting and step-up chart changes that we're making to the overall platform and solution, which will have far, you know, reaching consequences in driving operating leverage into the coming years. So Exalt is one such classic example, right? So we did not uh, go on to make incremental changes to an existing platform, but we built bottom-up. Uh, you know, uh, in a manner uh, that uh, our ongoing operating costs will be low. Our dependency on the large enterprise solutions where the licensing costs tend to spiral out of control very soon uh, comes down over a period of time. For that, very helpful, Chikram. Thanks a lot. Thank you. The next question is from, from the line of Sopram Tindatta from Amrit Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, starting with the international business, wanted to understand what is the mix of FA and RCA business do you see in this business, you know, in the next five years? That's the first part. And the second part is on the FA business, uh, you know, this is a platform which has significant growth opportunity, not only in Southeast Asia, but in other international markets as well. However, this is a mature market with, you know, well-entrenched competitors in this business already. 
So what are the differentiators for your SA you know, platform that you, know, you think will help differentiate and penetrate into you know, clients, uh, hedge funds, or you know, other um, asset managers? So if you could uh, uh, you know, start with those two questions on the international side before I go to some other questions. Okay, thank you. Um, the current mix of uh, TA to FA uh, in terms of the number of clients is about uh, 31 clients are TA and uh, 23 are in FA. Uh, FA thus far broadly has been platform only service, that is by virtue of our acquisition of Hexagram. Uh, the TA, however, uh, broadly is a full service model like how we deliver it in India today with to all our mutual fund uh, houses whom we manage today. Like, uh, we, uh, in terms of the overall revenue mix, as against the client mix, uh, you know, it would be around 80% would be a TA revenue and about 20% would be a fair revenue. Uh, the differentiation or what is the value proposition we have to offer for FA, right? I mean, uh, I think the question I heard was that as a platform play, we are not looking at ourselves as a pure play platform uh, right, for FA. Uh, which was the case uh, with uh, uh, the acquisition that we made. Instagram broadly was a platform-based company, not necessarily rendering a service layer on top. I could equate that in the case of TA, for example, to our platform, which is uh, called uh, Cable. Uh, and that platform also could be given out just as a platform too, right? Probably not so much in India, but outside the country. Uh, but we also have our entire processes and people and the risk management, everything associated with it and the governance, and hence we charge a certain basis point and which translates to the you know, participation of the growth of the industry in itself. So we are replicating the same model in FA. So it is no longer just platforms. So wherever we already have platform sale, we are upselling the service layer. Uh, all new clients, all new geographies, we are pitching for a full service model. It is still possible that the client could be interested only in the platform and not the service. And in some cases, it could only be the service and not even the platform. The value proposition we have uh, to offer is manifold. Uh, first off, are you right? There are several entrenched players, especially in mature markets such as Singapore, for example, uh, or in Europe and US, uh, but probably not so much in other geographies such as you know, emerging, uh, you know, Malaysia and Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines. Uh, you know, some of these markets uh, do not have entrenched players. Uh, but let me drive the answer in both cases. Even in the case of mature markets. The value proposition we have to offer is that we offer both FA and a TA and the entire digital stack, which most others do not point number one. Uh, number two, uh, we today are able to deliver at five to six basis points all of the solutions and more as compared to a typical fund administrator who could be charging anywhere between eight to 18 basis points, depending upon you know, which fund administrator and which AMC you're talking about, which means that I have a value proposition to optimize the cost to serve of most fund managers by a minimum of 25 to 30%. So that is the second big value proposition. Third uh, is in terms of our go to market and uh, you know, speed to market rather. Uh, you know, given we are you know, at heart, a tech company at this point in time. We are able to create solutions for our clients, which you know most of the fund administrators do not do because they are purely fund administrators, where we are a full full scale digital company, so to speak. For example, you know, we have created the first of its kind, a simple WhatsApp based distributor empanelment where we could onboard 30, 40,000 distributors in a single day. Now, these are alien concepts to most of the other operating geographies beyond India, and we're able to take these solutions at scale and be able to provide value to those clients. Fourth, while the entrenched fund administrators are there, they are more focused on the large fund managers because the quantum of the AUM is quite substantial, and ergo, the return they derive out of that is quite high. Whereas we see a, a large market of several boutique, small to medium fund managers who we believe are charged very, very high, you know, anywhere to the tune of 15 basis points, if I may, and also are underserved uh, because they are not the largest out there. And that offers a phenomenal amount of space for a player like us to start with small, medium sized AMPs, as we have already done in the case of mutual funds, and then expand into the larger, uh, larger alternatives. I, I hope I answered your question. That is very helpful and you know very elaborate answer. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, on the cost side, I wanted to understand. You know, you have been making investments in this business. You know, to drive and rightly so because you know it requires um, 
you know future proofing i also i wanted to understand given you know the focus on tech and you know the tech life cycle is getting shorter are these investments more recurring as compared to one off um, and that is how we should think of it that you know it should continue at a similar level rather than you know there being a you know currently there being a step up and and uh, going forward there being a step down in cost so just you know if you could give your thoughts on this thank you okay uh so i think the answer is uh, uh, part of it is yes and part of it is no um the big ticket uh, expenditure which is one time uh, and not recurring and you know it may be reset maybe once in a decade kind of a uh you know scenario is effectively the brand new platform creation right for example the exol platform that i spoke about for alternatives or the platform that we have now created for malaysia philippines hong kong singapore thailand now these are all one time creation or now uh, the entire uh, cloud strategy that we have implemented over the last 2 to 3 years uh you know whereby we moved much of our data layer onto the cloud much of our api infrastructure onto the cloud uh you know that is also one time uh and we are right now in the midst of the journey to take our mutual fund platform uh to be the most digitally advanced uh tier platform not just in india honestly you know anywhere in the world that is a one time uh expenditure one time investment not a recurring one at it now these are big ticket items uh, you know these are generational shifts as an industry and as an organization you know we are 35 years old into this and uh, uh you know what we've been able to do is add incremental uh, you know uh, enhancements into the platform uh, but we believe the time has now come uh, at least uh, in the context of the growth we have seen in the industry and what we expect in the future to completely reset it right and hence it's a one time and it's a big ticket item no doubt and we've already you know spent uh, much of it and you know expense of and some more to happen uh whereas there are several other recurring items uh, you know which is a continual as you rightly said the tech life cycle has come down so we create a lot of new features products solutions some of these are revenue generating in their own right for example today 60% of my revenue is coming from value added services those value added services are on the back of those platforms and solutions we have created so these are not just purely cost items but they are recurring revenue generating items for us right uh if i were to put a quantum to it i'd like to believe that anywhere about 60 to 60% odd would be a one time investment of the tech spend that we are doing currently maybe 40% of what we've been incurring could be a repeat uh, expenditure but again a lot of that would continue to drive revenue profile and not just a pure cost consumption for us uh, i just thanks again that sikan mentioned this is vivek mathur uh, you know we continue to spend almost 19 to 20% of our revenue in terms of it opex and capex capex is just you know 5% out of this 20% rest is all opex and we believe that you know as a growing company we have to invest in technology and as you rightly asked the question that isn't it recurring we feel that as the volume goes up in terms of revenue the percentage will keep coming down but we will continue to invest in technology so this Uh, you know, fifteen uh, to twenty percent of the revenue we will continue to incur on IT. Got it. And uh, so, fifteen to twenty percent on that elevated revenue base, or once the revenue base increases, that proportion goes down. Yeah. So last year, uh, for nine months ended December twenty three, we spent almost twenty two percent of our revenue. This year, we have spent nineteen percent of our revenue. Got so it. as a percentage it will keep coming down but the quantum will also keep going up as the overall revenue pretty goes up understood understood that's very clear and my last question is you know on the ms at the business and the aum growth so your overall aum you have been growing ahead of the industry but when i look at the equity aum that has been growing slower than the industry at least uh, the quarter it has been going slower than the industry so any particular reason behind this uh, you know i understand this is driven by your mutual fund partners but just wanted to understand you know why is there a difference and you know could this gap be reduced from going forward also sure i can take that uh no there is uh, you know there, there is no reason this is just the cyclicalities that i was talking about right uh in 2020 uh, our market share of equity uh i'm sorry in 2018 the market share of equity was 26% uh in uh, 23 it rose up to 20 uh, it rose up to 35% so there is a nearly 
800 to 900 basis point expansion that we saw in a matter of uh, you know three years at that point in time, uh, right? And now it is slightly less. Now that basically is a reflection of the fund performance, uh, right? I mean, you will have uh, you know if you look up the fund performance itself of various uh, schemes of various fund managers uh, in in the quadrants if you put Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 you would realize there is a constant movement of certain funds from one quadrant to the second, to the third, to the fourth, based on the fund performance broadly. And that would obviously drive the inflows of uh, the both SIPs as well as the lump sum into that particular team, which obviously will then roll up into that particular client. Uh, so 26 to 35, 35 now down to you know 33 odd, 33.5, uh, and, you know, in the next two, three quarters, uh, you know, it could go up again. So there is no uh, reason. I believe this is the cyclicality that, you know, we would see. Uh, it is possible that in the next eight quarters, it can easily go to 38, 40. I mean, it, it's very hard to predict. Uh, there is no underlying reason excepting the fund performance of, uh, you know, of the clients. And, uh, you know, sometimes the fund performance could favor some large asset managers. Sometimes it could be for other asset managers. So, so we expect this to the cycle to continue and hopefully in the next one to two years uh, our market share would expand uh, then reduce a little bit sure uh, that's very helpful thank you thank you ladies and gentlemen in order to ensure that management is able to address questions from all participants in the co conference please limit your questions to questions for participants should you have follow-up question we request you to rejoin the queue the next question is from the line of Ijaz Lakhani from Unifi Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Srikant. Uh, congrats, uh, congratulations to the team on the numbers, uh, and thank you for the detailed explanations. Uh, two questions, one on international and one on domestic. Uh, the international question, Srikant, uh, uh, thanks for clarifying that the yields that you know your uh, partners charge is eight to eighteen bips, and you're charging five to six. So we understand that uh, you know scope. And uh, what I've understood from your previous calls and this one is that the mid to boutique are the ones that you're chasing directly, whereas the larger ones you are chasing uh, through a custodian partner, etc. So I just wanted to understand that is there a specific conflict that arises because the custodian is like okay, you're going direct and will you come after my lunch? Is there any sort of a conflict in that? And also specifically, uh, the international piece, AUM grew, uh, degrew this quarter for about 3 to 4%, whereas the AIF piece, AUM grew 8 but revenues declined 3% uh, sequentially. So could you just explain that specific, uh, you know, uh, aspect as well? That's on the international. Brilliant. So, uh, so I'll, I'll clarify the point on the custodials and the non to begin with. Uh, we have uh, partnered with uh, you know two custodians um, you know in in the Asian region, uh, and uh, the custodies there usually also provide fund accounting, uh, right? And our partnership with them is largely for very specific mandates from the asset managers who want a single entity to provide transfer agency fund accounting custody all together, right? And given we offer TA and the custodies offer custody and FA, so this partnership is extremely limited for that very specific purpose of mandates where we need to have a joint go-to-market strategy, right? Outside of that, uh, you know, there is no conflict and there is no, uh, you know, uh, anybody stepping on somebody else's toes. So we would as much as partner with a custody to uh, you know, bid for a particular deal, we could easily be competing with the same entity for the next deal where the fund manager does not necessarily insist on a single entity to provide all three solutions uh, you know, under the hood. Uh, so to that extent, it had been a, a, an extremely harmonious relationship that we maintain uh, you know, with all of them. Right? Now, this is more for mutual funds. Uh, you know, as we are very intentful of growing our uh, alternative space quite substantively, especially say in the context of Singapore. In Malaysia, it is probably not very large, but in Singapore, it is quite large. So, is the case in Thailand. Uh, there, the custody and all is not a, a you know is not something that we you know we need to work with because there they look at TA and FA as one unified provider, which is where uh, my point about large fund administrator came to picture. 
uh, right? In almost in almost all the cases, it is the same administrator who provides both TA and FA, and custody is a completely different line of business. So, depending upon which asset class you look at, uh, you know, uh, we we will our partnerships work for that particular purpose. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, in the case of a single uh, you know bid, uh, it is a, a partnership. In the case of non-single bid, you know, uh, where we, there is no expectation that you know all these services get rendered under one boat. Uh, you know, we compete, uh, you know, with them. And then uh, as the track record uh, had been showing, you know, we've been winning, uh, you know, uh, at least a couple of international mandates, uh, you know, every single quarter. And hopefully uh, large ones are going to happen this quarter. Uh, now, in terms of the uh, the growth itself, yes, the, uh, the markets, uh, you know, there had been tested, we all know. For example, the Hong Kong market, uh, you know, wasn't uh, the brightest, and it was the case of Malaysia and others. So to that extent, uh, there had been a little bit of AUM degrowth. Uh, but that had not necessarily resulted in any uh, deep growth of revenue uh, in the case of international business, which had grown about 7%. Uh, but the overall, uh, the line of alternatives and international and the pensions, you know, there was a slight sequential uh, deep growth. That was on the back of the previous quarter, alternate investment funds uh, year on year had grown near 100%. This quarter, we had grown uh, 86%, so to speak. Uh, so a lot of fund mobilization in alternatives happened last quarter. A lot of new funds we won. The preceding quarters went live in the previous quarter, uh, but probably little less of that happened in the quarter three. Uh, and that was uh, the only reason why there was a slight sequential uh, you know, reduction. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, the alternatives uh, drawdown in the capital commitments are, you know, on the significant upswing, you know, into the later part of the quarter. And as we see into this quarter, uh, we expect the trend to reverse very, very soon. Got it. This is very clear. I think this is what you were alluding to when you said the controllable uh, components of the income. This is clear. Uh, thank you for that. And the second is on the domestic business. Uh, Shrikant, is, uh, you know, uh, how is the competitive landscape shaping up? Could you speak a little bit about that? Has competition in lieu of, you know, the stance that you have taken and the investments you're making, has that landscape shifted, changed? your comments about it, and what, in your opinion, are the key risks to KFIN's business today? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the competition landscape, uh, you know, one thing that we, we've always been proud of, and, you know, we continue, and we will ensure, you know, we will do that is set industry standards. Uh, you know, we, we haven't uh, traditionally been uh, following as much as a leading from the front uh, you know, whether it's in terms of the business solutions that we offer, getting into the new asset classes, new business lines, or the pure tech changes, uh, you know, whether it is cloud for strategies, whether it is, you know, driving a, a ad scale, a generic capabilities, uh, you know, including on the big data components, uh, where in fact we even manage some of uh, our competitors' clients in that space. Uh, you know, is something that we'll continue to do so. Uh, I think, you know, a competition, whether it's in the space of insured solutions or in the case of alternatives, bank insurance, mutual funds. Um, I think it's a very healthy, uh, you know, uh, trend, if I, you know, if I may, right? I think it's, it's great that uh, each of us, uh, you know, constantly innovate and bring to the market for the betterment of the investors, asset managers, and the distributor ecosystem, even the regulator for that matter. Uh, and you know that amount of healthy competition is driving down the cost. Uh, it is uh, significantly improving the ease of doing business, onboarding, uh, financial inclusion by moving into every last city and location, uh, creating digital solutions which uh, you know were hitherto to unthought of. For example, to onboard a, a, a client on uh, alternate investment fund, uh, you know, till about a year back was literally a three-day process and about 145-page uh, you know document that needs to be filled. You know, we took it upon as a challenge for ourselves, and then we created the country's first digital onboarding platform at scale where you could onboard anybody in three minutes. And not just HNI, Ultra HNI, but whether you're a trust or an endowment fund or any corporate for that matter. Right? So the competition landscape, I think, is constantly evolving. Uh, you know, we're all putting, uh, you know, enough pressure on each other, uh, and I think it's a very healthy decision uh, for the betterment of the industry over a period of time. Uh, that was one, and, and sorry, there was another question that you asked, I think I missed that. Just uh, any key risks that you feel that the business may face? Thanks. Uh, well, I think our business is riddled with risk, so, so there is to that extent, um, I think that there, there are several, and uh, we continue to track, and it is our duty, solemn duty, to ensure that the risks are mitigated at every point in time. Uh, uh, but, but let's say, you know, uh, 
continued uh, focus on cyber security yeah. and you know data privacy is an exceptionally important item for us. Uh, we manage near about uh, eight and a half nine crore uh, investors, uh, you know, in the country almost every. Uh, near about 80 85 percent of the financial investors in India have something to do with our organization. So we, you know, that's an enormous responsibility. And then hence, all these investments and efforts and all of that, you know, that we are continuing to do, is to ensure that you know this is all protected, right? Uh, so that that's definitely one thing that uh, we will continue to double down and make sure that we create, uh, you know, an absolute zero trust model uh, and uh, you know absolute amount of cybersecurity resilience. Uh, outside of that, well, the cyclicalities from a business standpoint will always be there. You know, we were fortunate we had a great year last year. It is possible every year won't be like that, uh, right? And that is exactly the reason why our risk uh, diversification strategy of uh, rendering uh, solutions for every asset class and for as many countries as possible will go on to play a big way. You know, hopefully, for example, you know, if, if India were to uh, have a, a subpar market market growth into this year or next year. Uh, it is strongly possible that the Asia could rebound. At which point in time, what now seems like a little tepid, relatively tepid growth of Asia compared to India, uh, will probably go on to help case in tech uh, the next year. You know, when those markets could be you know coming uh, you know back, uh, you know after uh, two years of relative underperformance. So it's all about risk diversification from a business standpoint. Outside of that, purely technology standpoint, uh, the data security uh, and uh, the infosec is something that we are tracking very, very closely. It is a very big topic for the regulator as much as it is for us. Uh, the DPDP uh, Act uh, is uh, is going to come into play uh, sometime soon. The dates are yet to be announced. Uh, but we are keeping ourselves ready uh, you know, uh, at the very earliest, even before any uh, instructions come from anywhere. Thanks, Adan Srikant. All the best to you and the team. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from CT. Please go ahead. Hello, so you are unmuted. Please ask a question. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, are you audible? Yes, sir, you're Hi, hi. Good morning. Uh, just a few questions from my side. First, on the domestic MS business, uh, if you can, you know, kind of break it down between the AUM link portion versus the non-AUM link portion, uh, let's say for the third quarter or nine months versus what it would be uh, last year. Second, on the issuer solutions business, it's, you know, when we calculate the revenue for Fodio, uh, adjusted for seasonality, like comparing 3Q versus 3Q, that seems to have gone up. So, uh, is it more of corporate actions or value added services? Explain it some more color on that. Uh, lastly, uh, on the international and domestic alternate uh, business segment, uh, you know, you did the growth number of uh, around 100% in 2Q and almost 80, 85% this quarter. Uh, but if you can just you know, split it uh, on an absolute basis for 3Q nine months this year and last year, that will be uh, really helpful. Um, uh, Sure, Srikant, I'll take this. You can add. Uh, you know, the breakup of domestic mutual fund into fee based business and non fee based business is 66% of our total revenue comes from fee based domestic mutual fund business, and anywhere between 3 to 4% comes from value added services. In terms of issuer solutions, this, this business, you know, currently, which is about 15.7% of the total revenue, uh, is range bound between 15 to 16%. But as the you know, number of folios uh, grow and we continue to add and migrate clients from other RTAs to KFINTECH. Fintech, uh, this revenue pool will continue to grow and with new IPO participation, this will grow. So revenue per folio, uh, you know, because of uh, various uh, value added services also. So this is not just one way of looking out of, uh, you know, pure folio based revenue, but there are corporate actions, uh, there are value added services, uh, which add to the portfolio income for case in tech. So it's a combination of three streams of revenue, the pure folio based revenue, more corporate actions means more event based revenue. And then there are value added services like EAGM, new voting, EML, PML, insider trading platform. So all these also continue to add as we penetrate more of these value added services to our client base of almost you know, 5,800 plus clients, uh, you will see an uptake in terms of portfolio income. On the uh, 
uh, AIF, international business in AIF, uh, you know, uh, while, while uh, overall revenue is uh, given here, I have already told the percentage of revenue that comes from, uh, you know, the international business of uh, global financial services uh, is about, you know, about 4%. And uh, AIF and, uh, you know, the uh, platform of TA of Hexagram, which is in power, contributes to about 5% of the total revenue. Balance comes from our pension and other small businesses. Does that answer your question? Yes. Just, just a small follow-up. You know, on the issue of solution of business, is it fair to assume that, you know, this quarter there were market tailwinds uh, leading to higher corporate actions with supported revenues? They wanted to get some sense of how much of this, uh, you know, would you consider as more from the current market situation versus like how much can you consider as more of recurring and your penetration of uh, clients through various uh, value-added products? So, issue of solution business doesn't have to do anything with the market. It is more number of market participants. So, if there are more demand accounts opening, that means uh, for listed companies, that means more revenue, uh, per, you know, for us because number of folios go up. So market-driven revenue is more in mutual fund. The, market, the fundamental consumption story and growth story of India remains intact. And the financial household savings coming into mutual fund and getting into direct equity continues to augur well. So it's not something that we are looking at a short-term jump. You know, it, it, this business uh, on a sustainable basis will continue to grow on a mid-teen kind of a growth. Shrikant, do you want to add anything? Thanks, Rick. Just add two more points. Uh, one is that, you know, in the case of issuer solutions, there is a price escalation that we orchestrate. Uh, unlike in the case of, say, asset management industry, where there are certain volume discounts given beyond uh, certain asset management thresholds, where the yield is important that we all practice. In the case of issuer solutions, uh, there is a price escalation that kicks in, you know, the once the contract ends, and that's, of course, negotiated price uh, increase. That was one of the reasons why uh, it had gone up beyond the corporate action. Second, uh, and importantly, is uh, that as we have won a substantial number of client mandates in the previous year, uh, including managing several ICOs, and all of that becomes a recurring annual revenue this year. The ICOs that we have done this year obviously will contribute to, to a higher revenue to the next year in addition to the corporate action, so on and so forth. The component of the corporate actions as an uh, overall share of uh, issuer solutions revenue is not substantially different from year to year. So the corporate, for example, the dividend declarations, the buybacks, uh, many of these, uh, you know, uh, have been pretty similar for us, uh, you know, and hadn't been very different to see as compared to the previous uh, bunch of years. Uh, but obviously it is the addition of the new clients and their declaration of corporate actions in addition to the retail folio expansion of nearly 5 million. Uh, you must have seen that 5 million net new folios have been added either because of the new uh, mandates we won or the transitions we have orchestrated into the previous year uh, and uh, or the corporate actions of those transitions and the new IPOs that have driven the growth. Got, got it, got it. Uh, thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Bharat State. From Quest Investment Advisor, please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. So one question on international side. See, as you are in transit, some winning the new client, then the, it uh, rolling out uh, takes after, say, two, three quarters, then which also incurred a transition cost. So overall, if you have to take little uh, longer perspective from three to five years, so how do we see that business and what could be the margin that we really like to have in uh, that business and can it i mean uh, um, be a very meaningful contribution to our overall top line thanks for asking that question um not on the reach yet and uh, you know uh, that's the reason why we have uh, uh, you know started the international search on uh, just to give you certain facts uh, four years back uh, you know the revenue was zero uh, today it is a little over uh, 11 to 12 percent of our revenue comes from a brand new line of business which never existed before. Correct. Uh, I think, right. So to that extent, I think it explains to us it's not just our intent and aspiration, but we have executed to the strategy and there is an addressable market to grow. 
our intent is to make that percentage, you know, to grow substantially higher. I would love to see in the next five years the international business occupying about 25% of our total revenue pool, even as the revenues of the overall metro business also continue to grow. Uh, three, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the margin itself, uh, I had called out at an individual account level, uh, you know, we have healthy margins. But because we are constantly winning deals and constantly creating new platforms for new countries, uh, and entering on certain transition costs, what have you, are seeing an overall margin profile slightly below. But on a steady state basis, I would expect the international business to have higher margins than the domestic business. For the very simple reason, two simple reasons I have cited. One, my yield is higher than it's in India, at least by a factor of 30%, if not more, and we'll try to do more in time to come. Uh, second, uh, pound to pound, if I get a 1,000 crore AUM in India versus a 1,000 crore AUM in Singapore, for example, uh, for the same thousand crore of AUM in India, if I do a million transactions, I will have to do 10,000 transactions in Singapore. As you could then imagine, the effort required is substantively lower as compared to what it is in India because the ticket sizes are small in India and it is a volume gain for us, for us here. Uh, so to that extent, the operating leverage will kick in as larger ANCs start to work with us. So we are uh, definitely optimistic about the margin profile in the long term. Uh, we have already seen, you know, good expansion in the last four years, and uh, it is a long-term business. You know, we are. This is not a one-quarter, two-quarter business. Uh, it is strongly possible that Muraro, you know, for example, if I were to draw a parallel to India, right? I mean, it could be winning one of the top five asset management companies in India versus, let's say, the bottom five asset management companies in India, right? Right. You see that the magnitude of the asset being managed is so substantively, you know, high, right? So about four lakh crore, five lakh crore AUM in the top five, versus probably a few thousand crores of AUM in the bottom five or in the mid five. So should we go on to win one or two such deals, you know, which is the conversations we've been having with the larger fund uh, fund managers today? The revenue growth won't be a 30, 40 percent, but could easily be two or three times uh, jump that can happen in a single year too. Whilst that is not necessarily the guidance I'm offering, or we are baking into the books, but I'm stating that's the kind of potential that exists. And I think we have done a sufficient amount of good work over the past four years for all the large asset managers to stand up and take notice of the work we've done. And hence the conversations now we are having are with the top five in almost every country. That's a good answer. I mean, very elaborate. So, and second thing on geographic expansion, if you can share some more color, say apart from this Singapore and Southeast Asia, so going little aggressively on the Western country. Yeah. So we, uh, so we are actually we are one deal shy of having 50% market share uh, for mutual funds in Malaysia. By the way. And, and that, that's just what we've done in four years. Now, in Asia, Singapore quite clearly offers the most uh, significant opportunities, but not so much in mutual funds. Singapore is more an alternative uh, market, so to speak, right? And there is roughly about $7 trillion worth of alternatives in it. Uh, and we uh, we have just launched our platform, Exalt, uh, you know, and we needed that. You know, so far our clients largely have been on the mutual fund space, not in the alternatives. Uh, and the reason why we toiled hard to create such a platform, which is applicable for anywhere in the world, and especially including for Singapore, is that very reason. Uh, so we are, you know, getting feet on the street in Singapore. Uh, as I've stated, you know, we are looking to secure, uh, you know, a, a license and an office space in Singapore to start. Uh, and platform is already there. So to that extent, I think the opportunity of a near seven trillion dollars worth of addressable market for the fund manager at uh, even an average of you know seven or six or even five basis points that we could charge uh, today, which is absolutely the lowest end of threshold, you know, offers a very large revenue potential. Of course, it needs to be executed to, you know, both the sales and the delivery and the execution. Uh, but that's what, uh, you know, we are working towards to and we have confidence in our abilities to do so. Now, while this offers the greatest potential in immediate, uh, you know, Southeast, uh, but if you move a little to the West, uh, you know, on the Midwest, you have, uh, you know, Dubai uh, is another area of interest to us. But clearly, much of the global wealth continues to reside between U.S. and Europe. Uh, so to that extent, starting our operations from there is very, very important. We are looking at both organic and inorganic routes, including acquisitions, both in Europe and U.S. Whichever happens first, organic or inorganic, is how we go to start there. Okay. Thanks for the elaborate and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohan from Anvision Capital. Please go ahead. Hello. 
Yes. Uh, so uh, just uh, one question on the issue issue solution part. So uh, like you said that you know, your aspirations are uh, growing with teams and the issue solution business. So so if we you know just delve a little deeper there and see uh, what kind of growth do you expect uh, to come from the volume growth that is increasing in number of failures. And what part of it will be, you know, uh, corporate action, value added services, escalations, etc. So, so that's the breakup between these two, if you can. Certainly, I. Uh, so even if you were to give, give a regular on business as usual uh, profile of uh, the revenue component, near about uh, seventy percent comes from the polio based pricing, uh, and about. Uh, 20% uh, to 22% on the uh, corporate events, and the rest is the corporate, uh, sorry, corporate actions, uh, and the rest is the corporate events. When I say corporate events, I'm talking about conducting and holding uh, AGMs and, uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth, whether it is electronic or otherwise. Uh, our, uh, the, the chair, or rather this particular component breakdown of revenue for issuer solutions, uh, you know, had had been pretty similar, uh, you know, over the last three to four years. Uh, excepting that, we have added a fourth component, which is the value-added solutions, which includes, for example, uh, us creating insider trading platforms and administering it, uh, managing and administering ESOPs uh, for many of the clients, so to speak. Now, that pool of revenue has basically uh, added about 6 to 7% of additional revenue overall, so to speak. So on a business as usual basis, I'd expect uh, that uh, you know 65 odd percent would continue to come from the polio based pricing, and about you know 15 to 17 percent on the corporate actions, which is by that dividend declarations, V mergers, what have you, uh, and uh, seven to eight percent of equal proportion coming from corporate events and value added services. That's it. That's it. So, so what I was also alluding to was. Uh, so this breakup was really helpful, but what I was also leading to was that uh, if you say that you, know, you aspire to grow mid teams in the issuer business, issuer solution business, so so then what is the volume growth that we can ex expect in number of folios? You know, say for example, eight percent volume growth, eight percent uh, other other services uh, increase in pricing, etc. So what what are your aspirations there? So breakup of this mid teams is what I was looking for. So I believe the volume, uh, volume in the form of folios, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, factor anything around a 10% increase in the uh, volume of folios, uh, you know, will easily drive a mid team uh, growth uh, in the business. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, uh, the volume uh, growth of folios can come from. It also depends on which client. As as I've explained, uh, you know, this is unit pricing and it's a negotiated price. It is not the same for any, uh, you know, any two clients. Uh, so, which particular client, uh, you know, is growing faster will also drive uh, the revenue growth corresponding to that. Uh, and also, uh, if the volumes and the folios are getting added more because of IPOs and transitions, it always adds a faster revenue growth profile to us. I mean, it's hard to give a very specific number, but let's say an eight to ten percent increase in the folio, uh, you know, would get us uh, into easily a mid-team kind of growth. That's wonderful. I think this is really helpful. Thank you. So uh, one more uh, question was uh, on the Indian EIS business. So so what is the kind of yield you know we can expect on the medium term on the Indian EIS side? The so the yield in the EIS had been uh, you know pretty much they try and drive from the very beginning. Uh, you know uh, if you do only TA or only SA or if you are doing both. Uh, you know, traditionally, this industry in India had grown only with CA, uh, both us and our competitions focusing on that. Uh, but since we acquired uh, and added the entire FA capability over the last 24 months in India, we are now one of the very few who can uh, offer TA and FA, and definitely the only from India who has their own proprietary platforms uh, for TA and FA. The yield, uh, you know, for TA uh, standalone uh, would be in the range of, say, you know, one and a half uh, to two. Uh, FA would be around 0.5 to 0.75, and a composite deal could get you anywhere around two and a half to three basis points. This was, this was very helpful. Thank you. And, and just the last question, if I can. Uh, you said that you have around 300 crores of you know, cash uh, surplus cash available with you. So, just on the acquisition plan, if you can, you know, just give us a uh, how, how you look at it. Greg, do you want to pick that up? 
Yeah, so your question is about how we are going to look at the cash surplus that we have, correct? And, and, and uh, acquisitions in you know, organic part of it. So we continue to evaluate uh, acquisitions. At any point of time, we have three or four targets that we continue to look at. And historically, if you've seen, we have been doing uh, small size acquisitions. And as our aspiration is to, uh, you know, grow in terms of either growing our product bouquet or acquiring clients or expanding into geographies, from these three lenses, we continue to look at opportunities. So you will see that, you know, uh, uh, even in the coming year, uh, we will continue to explore that only when we find that the proposition of acquisition is going to add substantial value uh, in terms of uh, shareholder value creation. Uh, it's not just acquiring and then saying, you know, we just added top line. So we are looking at uh, exponential growth by combination of two entities and not just pure acquisition. So we will use that and we will also see, you know, the board will also consider in terms of uh, beyond acquisition, if there is surplus cash, uh, you know, board will also look at uh, dividend policy, uh, and, you know, once the financial year ends. So uh, M&A is, is now something that we have been doing successfully. Four M&As we have done in the last six years, seven years. So we, we feel that, you know, that is something which we will continue to do and utilize this to create future modes. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, we have to end. We will reach out to people in the queue separately. As that was the last question, I would now hand the conference over to Mr. Devesh Agarwal from IIFL Securities Limited for closing comments. On behalf of IFL Security, I thank the Kfin Technologies Management for giving us an opportunity to host a call today. Uh, before we conclude the call, sir, would you like to add any closing comments? Uh, thank you so much once again, the way for moderating it and, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, investors and analysts you know, showing very, very keen interest and rightfully so. Uh, the growth areas and the emphasis on uh, international, on the alternatives is rightly placed. Uh, we continue to stay exceptionally focused on innovation value addition to our clients uh, while ensuring that uh, the operating leverage on the cost uh, is, uh, you know, uh, managed and focused to. Uh, we have been uh, diversifying the risk, and that will add an amount of cost, which I think is extremely important and well worth it uh, for uh, long-term uh, you know, prospects of the growth. Aspirationally, I've stated this several times before. I just want to state it one last time and conclude the call. We intend to make Kfin Tech uh, the first company from India, uh, which is globally relevant in the space of capital market infrastructure. Uh, that has been our uh, North Star, and a lot of work we've been doing uh, is eventually to get that far. If India could replicate this uh, in IT, ITS, generic pharma, any line of business, uh, there is uh, no reason whatsoever that we can't do the same in the space that we operate in. Uh, so together, and on behalf of my entire management team, uh, which had been exceptionally behind us uh, to ensure a continual financial performance as much as uh, you know, setting up ourselves for long-term success. Uh, you know, a very happy investing, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining the call today. Ms. Khan, you, may can, you can conclude the call now. Thank you. On behalf of I, IIFL Securities Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.